patience and understanding. <laughs> oh, and there he is. Yes, I made it. Yes, I'm so happy, Mark. Oh my can you God, hear me? I, was, I was sweating. Yes, I can hear you just fine. Yeah, you and me both sweat. I told you yesterday that technology <laughs> is not always my friend. Uh, <laughs> it, it was just a, anyways, a slight setting that was not ready and here we are. Okay, well, I'm so, so happy and grateful that you're joining my Army of Artists. Um, I am a huge fan of your work, of your persona. Um, your wife is amazing. I've um, become to know you both, and um, I consider you both my friends. So welcome to the program. Thank and uh, please tell us your name, where you're at, where do you work, and a little bit of your story. Okay. Um, so I'm Mark Eanes. I live here in Benicia, California, which is the Bay Area, just north of San Francisco, with my wife, Maria. Um, I've been here in the Bay Area for, well, 50 years. I came here from the East Coast, which is a story unto itself, which we may or may not go into. Um, and so, yes, I've been here in Benicia in this particular studio in what's known as the Arsenal area. It's a historic area, Sandra, of a lot of uh, old military buildings going back to the 19th century. So it's a pretty cool in, uh, setup with lots of artists. Many of us, like myself, have been in this particular arsenal. We call it the neighborhood for 25 years plus. Oh, wow. But I know many of my neighbors intimately. We, Many of us have been here for a long time. This is a neighborhood that's quite special. Benicia is a quiet little town on the river, Sacramento River. And so we're sort of tucked away from the big city of San Francisco, Oakland, and Berkeley. But I work in Oakland and San Francisco. I am an associate professor of art at California College of the Arts. It used to be California College of Arts and Crafts. It's a wonderful college. I also, for years, Sandra, taught at other colleges, San Francisco State University, a few junior colleges. But mostly I've been with CCA for 30 years, teaching 30 Oh my years. goodness, wow. So, uh, yeah, full-time professor there, and right now, this year, luckily, I'm on sabbatical, so I've been able to really focus on my work, and um, that's a start, I guess. Is that, is that is um, that because of COVID that you took the sabbatical? No. Or it just happened to be that it was the same year? It happened to be the same year that I was eligible. I applied for sabbatical and was awarded a full year of sabbatical to focus on my own studio practice and projects that I've been working on, which we can discuss when we start talking, if you want, about language. Yes, but before we get there, um, yeah. tell us a little bit about your childhood. Were you always involved in the arts? Was it something that um, interests you? Uh, were your parents... Um, involved in the arts or or did they um, presented you with opportunities? Okay, so a uh, quick story here. I'll try to make it concise. <laughs> okay. It is as we all have great stories. Um, so I was raised in the Midwest in Indiana till I was about 13. My father was and still is a professional photographer. He's 94 years of age. Oh my goodness. Living in Florida, he's quite healthy still. So he was a professional photographer. My younger brother, Kent, is a professional photographer. So yes, I saw a lot of art. I was in his studio as an eight-year-old watching the magic happen in the dark room. Now, when I graduated, so from there in Indiana, Sandra, we moved down to Virginia East Coast, where I went to high school. At age 17, I graduated with no future plans whatsoever, none. And I was living with my father. Parents were divorced. We weren't getting along. I ran away. And wow. I, I came out to California to be with my uncle, my mother's brother. He helped me out at that point in time, 18 with no direction at all. He said, what about college? I said, okay. And I had a sketchbook that I was keeping. I always liked to draw. So he said, fine, we'll, we'll get you into school. And that was my first year in college in 1970. I was 18. So I just celebrated 50 years of making art in September. So I went. Oh, that gave me the chills. That's amazing. It's great. So you went into it right away. So at age 17, I was in my first drawing and painting class. Yep. And I went two years at a junior college in the Bay Area, then two years at UC Santa Barbara. In 1974, I got my bachelor's of fine arts degree. 
moved up to San Francisco thinking I would make it as an artist, and that was a sick joke. <laughs> Rude so, awakening. Uh, Rude awakening. Oh, yeah, I was going to for myself at, at age 23 or 4. Uh, what happened was, uh, and this is an interesting part of the story, Sandra, it's an important part of the story. Uh, at age 22 or so, um, I found a job as a desk clerk at a hotel in downtown San Francisco. Now, I worked for two years from 74 to 75, 76, and I took my life savings after two years, and I traveled throughout Europe for four and a half months. Just me. Backpack, camera, sketchbook. And my itinerary throughout Europe were all the museums that I wanted to see artwork in the flesh. All the work I'd looked at in slides and books. And those four and a half months was probably the most profound chapter of my life. It really cemented, if you will, my love for art, art history, and painting. Um, then I came back to the Bay Area, and with the exception of living on the North Coast in Mendocino for about five years, I've been in the Bay Area all this time. And then finally, just to kind of put a cap on this, in 2013, I had my first sabbatical for a year, and I repeated my 1976 Euro tour. Got a backpack, sketchbook, camera, went to Europe in 2013 for four months and did pretty much the same. Traveled throughout Europe, went to many museums, met my wife, Maria Love, got married. And, um, and here I am. Well, quite the story, my gosh. Um, I can relate to you because when I graduated uh, from high school, I lived in Florence, Italy for six months. Oh. And uh, that's where my love of art started. I didn't even know I, I loved art. I loved museums. I loved, I mean, I did know, but I went with my parents because they took me, but it wasn't something that I did for me. I did it for them in the beginning. And then after that, I found the love of art. And it was just, it's, it's an incredible um, way of learning every day. You're walking and you're seeing right and left all this incredible artwork so you, it's very impactful so um so i can totally relate with you so um when did you decide okay i can do this i got this um i can be a photographer a painter all these things that you were hats with and then now when do you decide i can teach so that's a great question um from um so when i lived up in mendocino uh, the coast the north coast beautiful little village. I, I supported myself, Sandra, as a landscape gardener and did that for many years. So a lot of gardening and then just kept my art practice. Then in 1984, I had been up there for a while. I could have stayed there and led a fairly blissful life in the country, but I, I was mm, anxious, I guess, or uh, wanting to go back to graduate work. So in 1984, I was accepted at Mills College here in Oakland to work with Jay DeFeo, the painter who I really wanted to work with. Brilliant painter. She's passed away. But if anyone doesn't know Jay DeFeo's work, check her out. And I worked with uh, Jay, did my graduate work in Oakland from 84 to 87. Now, prior to that, I had done a number of jobs to support myself as an artist. I think it's worth mentioning that. I was a gardener. I also did other things. I was a house painter. You know, I waited tables like a lot of, did a lot of things to support my habit, frankly, for a bunch of years. When I got my master's degree, Sandra, in 1987, that's when I really started to serious fashion. Uh, and by 1990, I was teaching at a number of colleges here in the Bay Area. So that was 30 years ago. And I've been teaching ever since. For a number of years also, uh, I would go down to Los Angeles every summer to work with high school students in a pre-college program known as California State Summer School for the Arts. It's one of the most preeminent pre-college programs. And I taught figure drawing there for years and eventually became the chair of the visual arts department for a few years. So I've worked with that population as well. Um, and, and I've taught kind of all over. I went up to Alaska for four summers and worked with high school kids in Alaska for a arts program. So I like working with the younger population as well as the college age. Right now I'm teaching everything from anatomy to color and design and straight up drawing and painting, et cetera. So I uh, am blessed. I know you hear that word a lot, I really feel that way that I can work with young artists and have been able to do so for 30 years. For me, not even a job, just calling. 
that I absolutely love doing. That's amazing. So what would you say to someone who is in the verge of starting maybe to wanting to teach, but they're not sure if they, if they got it, you know, if they feel the confidence and that it factor that we're all looking for, right? What would you say to those people? I do have an answer for that. Um, okay, so here is the thing. Um, I work, as I said, with young artists in their 20s oftentimes, and when they become seniors, we have a big conversation about making it in the art world and continuing um, practice. Now, I might be talking to many, many people who are, you know, had a life and are retired and all that stuff. So this is also germane to them as well. It's germane to everyone. So here's my answer. Years ago, I listened to a interview by Terry Gross on NPR, uh, Fresh Air is the name of the program, and she was interviewing a very famous uh, English actor uh, in, uh, who was quite older. Um, he was a contemporary to Sir Laurence Olivier, the famous actor, and he was asked by her the same question you asked. What would you say to actors who want to make it into the field of acting and to do it as a, you know, as a, as a discipline? His answer, Sandra, was so beautiful so succinct, I remembered it verbatim. It's two sentences, three actually. He said, I would say to, act, to young actors or even older people who want to act, don't. You want to act, and I was startled. And then he said, if you need to act, do. Oh. And then be prepared for, young, for, be prepared for unfair things to happen along the way. So I always tell my students, if you want to draw and paint, don't. But if you need to, do. So this is the difference between a want and a need. And I tell them, if you need to do your art, nothing will stop you, nothing. You'll wait tables, you'll paint houses, you'll do gardening, you'll pull weeds, you'll do whatever you need to do. And if people are in other, you know, your 30s, your 40s, your 50s, your 60s, it doesn't matter. Oh, if Mark, I love this so much. I think I'm gonna get that part of my vocabulary now. Right? I mean, that is so clear. Profound, profound. It's, and it is, it, like you said, it's two words, but it is so clear. It's clear. If you want to do something, yeah, you'll do it. You'll fun around. You might, you know, it might be, you know, you'll try it and then you'll get frustrated or whatever and you'll give up. But if you need to do something, you're just going to do it and nothing will stop you. No one or anyone. No, no I, thing. I love that. I, I really do. Thank you for sharing that with us. Yeah. And, um, so how do you now practice? Um, do you have a studio at home? How is that, um, how is that working for you now in, in COVID? Were you affected by it? Or is it something that it actually helped you um, be more stable in your, in your uh, art practice? So the short answer is that because I was on sabbatical, which is brilliant, um, yes, I had um, much more time to be in the studio, and I made really good use of that time, uh, particularly the first half of this year. I worked every day, really, in the studio painting, and we'll take a look at some point. And then, um, but I have, a, I have a pretty strong, I shouldn't say pretty, I have a strong studio practice regardless, because for me, it is a need. And so, you know, most days I'm in there. Now, there are artists, by the way, I'll be honest, there are artists who are in the studio every single day of their lives. I am not that person. I'm in there most of the time. But I also like taking hikes. I like going to the beach with my wife. I like traveling. So, you know, life is... But you balance really well. Yeah, I like to balance. But the studio practice is in my bones. It's in my blood. If I don't, by the way, if I don't do it uh, for a period of time, that could be a week or longer or whatever, I start getting very irritable and Maria realizes I'm not fun to be around. So <laughs> at that point, you know, let me go draw and paint for a while and I'll be a bit. <laughs> I think it's, um, it's a memory thing too, right? When you are showing up every day and um, practicing either in your sketchbook or canvas or paper or whatever your medium will be, it's something that your, your brain just does that automatically. If you don't show up and you don't do it, then you kind of get scared when you're back into it. You're kind of just paralyzed with yourself. You're like, can I draw? Can I paint? It's like all these questions that you start, you know, to, to take really seriously. And then you have to start, it's like almost like 
starting from zero. Does that happen to you? Well, the key is, yes, the answer is just the key here is momentum. And so what we're discussing is momentum. So when you have momentum in the studio, um, then you're on a roll. And, and even on a bad day, you walk away, you know, okay, tomorrow's another day, I'll do better. Um, I'm fortunate in that I have a live work situation here in this, um, we have a, you know, a really nice space here. And so I live where I work. It's for me to just, you know, 10 steps away and I'm working. But the issue again is momentum. Once you lose that momentum, it's rough. It, you know, you feel rusty, you got to scrape the rust off the wheels and, and start in again. And that's never fun or easy. So um, on the other hand, on the other hand, sometimes a break is a bad thing. You know, I do like to travel. When I travel, I take a camera and a sketchbook. But when I come back, I feel renewed. I feel refreshed. So I think there's something like that. But mostly, I'm in the studio because I love the momentum. And I love going to bed thinking about painting and waking up thinking. Yes, that is the best feeling, actually. Have a um, fun. <laughs> Yes. Um, okay, so now we're so excited because you're going to give us a gallery tour and you're going to show us your studio and um, you guys are in for a treat. So I'm going to take off the comments so we can see Mark's work and I'll turn them back on at the end of the interview. So if you have any questions for Mark, um, we'll do them then. So let's go ahead, Mark, and switch the camera around. And there we go. All right, so I'll very briefly give you a quote the tour and show you that uh, I'll swing it around here. So we're going to go into the studio here in just a moment. Uh, but before we do, I'll give you a sense of the space. It's a large space. You're only seeing half of it. So that's the studio. Um, the live part is here, you see, and beyond. So I'll just walk you quickly into the live space. Um, and this is uh, one of the paintings. Uh, wow. On. Um, when did you do that painting, Mark? Oh, it's about three or four years old. Okay. It's four by four foot. Um, library. Um, then we look out on the river. You can't see it, but the river is uh, in the hills. Oh, yes, you can see. Yeah. It's a fabulous view. Wow. It's a beautiful view of the river. And then we have, you know, the, um, I'll face it this way. So then piano, lots of Chotskys on the piano. <laughs> I'm a big Chotsky fan. So, you know, we got lots of little guys there. Um, I'm sure they're all from traveling and... Well, every Chotsky has a story as we I'm know. I'm sure, I'm sure it does. And uh, here's another section here with more masks and Chotskys and my uh, ode to Man Ray there with the uh, warm. So that's, and then Maria's office space here. And then we have the wall of nature and such here. So that's the live space. Um, so here is studio space. Wow. Um, I'll take you around. We'll look at some work and then we'll chat. And then you want yes. me to do a demo at some point. And then we're going to do a demo, which okay. I'm super excited about. So let's dig in and show us your, your work. Um, so workstation here, for instance. Um, uh, lots of swatches. I make these swatches, Sandra, when I'm teaching uh, language of design and color and doing the color workshops. So here's some work for people. I'll, I'll zoom in on a few pieces. Let me back up, Sandra. Can I just do this for a second? Yes, for sure. All right. So here was um, my COVID wall. <laughs> wow. I would like to live in that COVID wall. Yeah. You know what's interesting, Sandra, is during COVID time, uh, my work got a lot more colorful a lot more colorful. Now, I, I work with mixed media, and I brought out a bunch of uh, trays to show you. These are just portions of trays. I have literally thousands of color swatches of all sorts, shapes, and sizes. I've got lots of ephemera, old letters. So because I do mixed media, I have literally thousands of things to work with in my, in my paintings. How do you organize that that part? Do you like you said you have it in trays, or do you do you? I mean, because you have a limited space, so you can't have everything out, right? Right. So it's over here. Here's the here's the library of stuff, ephemera. Okay. I want to say to your audience and to the artists that I do not consider myself a collage artist. I consider myself a mixed media artist that likes to work with paper. So. Interesting. 
uh, it's useful to get into close into some of these so you can see the surface. So here's a large painting. This one's called Hill House. It's four by four feet. Now I should also tell you and everyone. Is it on a board or canvas? Sorry. It's on, it's on panel. panel it's on board. panel. And I work on many, many, many layers. So underneath this painting are numerous layers of paint and ephemera. It takes many, many days, but I want to zoom in here to get a sense of the, of the uh, close-ups. Oh, wow. Surface texture. Oh, wow. Did you draw that into a, that, or is that a part that's of a... Old, that's an old print. Okay. Um, so I think it's useful to get in close to these because that's yes. what the action is with these paintings. Um, I, I should tell you that I'm very fond, uh, when I travel, Sandra, I'm very fond of old walls. It I totally, it, I was actually going to say that. It gives you the idea of a, of a rough wall that has a lot of history behind it, and there's a lot of scratching happening, and there's so much. I love that you have to get up close and personal with your pieces, because then you have a conversation with them. Exactly. So here's another piece, okay? So this is a, a larger piece, too. And once again, I really love to play with surface texture, and I'll come in and close here as well again, so you can see uh, everything from Renaissance, because I love to put in <laughs> references to art history. Um, and then when you come in closer, of course, there's lots of texture and so on of these areas. So I just wanted to show you that because I think that's where the action is. Yes, I, I love, love that. I, and, uh, I mean, your, your use of color, I mean, you're obviously, um, a professor in this, but your use of color, I mean, it's something to know about it, but it's a different thing to transfer and to know um, how to balance everything. Um, and the values and the design that you're using is so effective. Thank you, Sandra, I appreciate that. So I'll show you some more of the studio. Um, when I work large, I work at an easel. I'm, these are some um, exercises I'm doing for our new course to follow up on the language of color, which is the language of design. So these are some exercises, and I'll pull back a little bit here to show the rest of the studio. Oh, wow. I'll go here for the demo in that corner. Yeah. There is a large piece, and I'll show you a couple other things. So you can see on the far wall there, there are some... Um, That's the language of art, isn't it? <laughs> this is the language of design. So we, we completed the language of color which I urge your um, listeners, if you go to markings.com, it's a six week course and it's something that people can subscribe to and keep forever. And um, we have over 400 artists internationally now all over the world taking the course and it's created a community that we're very proud of. So can they, can they, can you buy um, at any time the course? Is it available can, all the time? Right, so you can buy the course anytime. I think it's $4.25. Okay. It's, it's very, very, um, how shall I say? It's very in-depth. It's very um, comprehensive. We mm -hmm. have lectures, demonstrations, exercises, art history slideshows, podcasts, Q&A, bibliography. It's very, very comprehensive. It's basically a core, it's a college course. I love that. In color that people have access to and they can take as long as they want to do it. So can um, you repeat your website where everyone can go and register, please? Yeah, and that there's a landing page there, Sandra. They can check it out before they decide what they want to do. Okay. So it's markeens.com, E-A-N-E-S, markeens.com. There's a link there for classes and this right. uh, language of color. And oh, go to a landing page which shows them the entire chapters of each um, episode that we're doing. There's and six the best thing is that you have it forever. It's not like it's up for one year and then it's gone. You have Correct. it forever so you can revisit again and again. Correct. It's up forever. And I want to make a point about this, if I may. Yes, please. Um, and I'll come back. And, oh. uh, and I'm, I'm spotting something that we need to ah. talk about. <laughs> yes. So... so the point, real quickly, I want to make about the language of color. Go ahead. I always tell the artists that I'm working with, and this I do in my live um, 
courses as well, Sandra. Number one, I'm not about showing people how to make art. I'm not about that. I'm about giving them tools and language for their own journey. So I'm also not about having people try to work like me. I have no interest in that. So I know that sometimes artists will work with the given artist so they can learn how to work that way. And I appreciate that. I respect it, but it's not who I am. I'm much more about giving artists as many tools and as much visual vocabulary and language to, to, to chart their own course. And that's what language of color has done for many artists. They realize that color and the study of color is really um, difficult. It's really difficult. So I do my best to demystify it, to help them see how they can produce, for instance, thousands of colors with a given yellow, red, and blue. That's just one example. So um, here are the two, you mentioned these two pieces. So um, Mark is donating you guys these two pieces for Art Cause, Feeding America. Today they're for sale. We're asking $250 for each one. They're um, two incredible pieces of artwork that Mark is donating. So if you're interested, please DM me or Mark and we'll take it from there. But they are phenomenal pieces. Um, they can be yours. You could be helping for each one, uh, 2,500 meals. So just think about that. If you buy both of them, you will be helping five for 5,000 meals. Or if you want to buy them individually, you will be um, buying $250, which is the equivalent of 2,500 meals. So I can't thank you enough, um, Mark, for donating and being a part of this army of artists and this effort to help people in need. Thank you, Sandra. I'm, I'm happy to be part of your, um, your incredible um, gift, really, is what it is. And well, we have a buyer already, Annette, oh, I got you. So um, I will, please, um, Annette, please uh, DM me and, um, and we'll take it from there. So um, thank you so much. I can't thank you enough. So um, let's go and um, start our demo. Okay. Uh, so real quick. Um... Oh, yes, I forgot the most, well, one of the most important things, your books and all, everything that you have out there. Well, I just real quickly wanted to show you a couple of things and then I'll, we'll, we'll dive into the demo. Um, these two pieces I started yesterday after I talked with you. So these are rough starts just to give people a sense of how I get started, which is what I'm going to do today in the demo. I'm just going to get started. So these go through many, many reiterations. That's just the beginning. And then that will all get sanded back. And then I layer over many, many, many times. So the finished pieces, Andrea, you can barely see, you'll probably see maybe 20% of that left over at the end. So much of it goes away. So do you use um, acrylic or oil? What is- what? I'm working with acrylic. You are, okay. So here is the, what I'm gonna work on. And now I'm gonna put, see, hopefully get this figured Before out. Before we go there, Mark, yes. can you yes. just show us your books? Um, oh yeah. So this is part of the library that we're working with for language of, sorry, let me get a. For the language of design, this is a small portion. I mean, literally the tip of the um, iceberg. So I've got books on, textbooks on color and design. And then I draw on over 225 artists. Each artist in my computer has a file. Deben Korn, the quill makers of Guy Bend, a book online, the wonderful artists of Hilma of Klint. Uh, this is Robert Rauschenberg. And then in my library, I literally have hundreds of books that we draw from for both the color, both for the language of color and the language of design. I just so, love that you have um, your grayscale there um, together with the books. It could be just yeah. an incredible <laughs> photograph right there with your wall. It's amazing. It's so inspiring. Thank you very much. Well, okay, let's get this set up here. Yep. You're going to help me see if this is. Uh, yep, it's great. Do you see the whole thing? I do. I see the now, whole is thing. It le is it level? Yes, it's perfect. Beautiful. Let's get this in place. Okay. How's okay. It? Good. Great. So I'm going to start in. Um, can you hear me okay? Yes, 
I can hear you great. How much time do I have roughly, Sandra? Can you give me a um, You have like a good 20 minutes. So oh, that's a lot. Um, I figured we would give enough time and then we'll have some time for the end of the interview for questions since I have all the um, uh, comments turned off. Great. And I have a brief, very brief, two minute, not even two minute uh, artist statement I'd like to close with if I might. Yes, for sure. All right. So here's the beginning of a panel, just so you can see. It's already been sanded. I do a lot of sanding with an orbital sander in terms of layers. So this is a beginning. You can see there's already some stuff here. I don't know how much detail you're picking up, but here we go. Uh, now, what you're not seeing are my tools of the trade. I've got, you know, the matte medium. I've got a brush. This is for scraping. All my tools are on the side, but let's get moving here. Now, normally, I go to those trays of mine. And I'm painting, but I'm also using a lot of collage. So I went to the trays last night and found a few pieces that I could start with. This is actually part of a palette that I, you know, was painting on. So I, I was going to say that um, today I found one of your followers, Sally, if you're watching, she says she uses her color uh, palette uh, papers and she's just going to, you know, reuse them for this kind of work or for her sketchbook. And I thought, you know, that's brilliant. We should all do that. One of my heroes, uh, if you can hear me okay. Yes. One of my heroes, I have a few, uh, is Richard Diebenkorn. He's been very influential in my own practice and career. He had a little note on his studio, Sandra, that said, waste not. Um, <laughs> so I don't believe in waste. I try not to waste paper or paint or anything. So now what I've done is I put matte medium on both sides of this thing. And now I'm, I put it on the substrate, I put it on the back of the piece that I'm going to adhere, and then I put it on the top of the piece. This, these um, curl a little bit, but then what I do, Sandra, is I take this squeegee here, and then I just do this. Yeah, and that takes the bubbles out, usually. Takes the bubbles out, the wrinkles, and so on. And the excess of the matte medium. Like that. Now, in the beginning, I, I need to mention that in the very beginning, I moved fairly quickly. Like you saw those two pieces I showed you earlier. Yeah. So I get going really quickly in the beginning. I make decisions that are pretty quick because I don't want to get um, fussy in the beginning of a piece. I just want to lay things down and see what's working. You know what I mean? So you no. don't use any gesso, huh? You go straight into the board. Straight into the board. Uh, yeah, I do. Because sometimes I like the color of the board. Sometimes I will paint a, a color and then just keep working like I did. But sometimes I just go right in. So here's a piece. I'm going to lay that down here. So again, I, I'll just show you what I'm doing. I lay the matte medium. Let me ask you something, Mark, because when you're working so fast, do you, yeah. do you actually make the composition um, beforehand or as you're going you look through your papers and then you're like okay this one will work or do you go grab and you know and, and have everything ready no it's the latter I I just work on the, I work on the fly okay so I've got a lot of stuff nearby uh, it, I work in a frenzy in the beginning okay I'm a frenzied frenzied person in the beginning but it's controlled frenzied and I do, I do move something around. So last night, I'll be honest with you, I cheated. I made a few moves ahead of time so I wouldn't be just Well, stuck. yes, because you're demoing. So, but yeah, so, I understand how it's like activating a canvas. It's right. the same way, right? You're not thinking, you're just going. But I do, I do. Here's the advice I give to my artists that I work with and students, and I give it to myself. I give it some thought, but I don't overthink it. Okay. How do you do, how do you balance that? That's very hard to do. So here's the thing. It's a longer conversation. Um, I had an interview with Nicholas Wilton about a year or two ago, and I talked about the three stages of creation, the beginning, the middle, and the end. In the beginning, you can go crazy. I can go crazy and not worry because I know I'm going to make changes, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't have to be precious in the beginning stage because things are going to change. In the middle phase, things are, I'm slowing down between my moves because now I have to look a little more carefully in the middle phase. Sound about right? Yes. And then when I get to the end phase, this is a concise version of what I talked with Nicholas about. 
in the end phase, Sandra, I'm much more careful between my moves. I'm taking much more time. I might stare at the piece for an hour before I make a move, you see? So it really has to do with the different stages. So because this is the beginning stage, I can make lots of changes. I can, be, uh, I can take risks in the beginning because I know that it's going to go through many changes. That's actually the way I work. Now, some people don't work that way. They want to be careful from the beginning to the end, and that's fine. I just don't work that way. So I like to get a lot of things down quickly. Then I step back and I look at it. I also wow, look at that red together with the, <clears throat> with the yellow. The, I mean, it is just, it's just divine. <laughs> so I like to work in such a way that I give it some thought. Like I might take this little blue note right here. See this blue note? Yeah. I might see what it looks like over here, over here, over here, over here, and decide it wants to go here for now. Do you follow me? Yes. So I do take some time. Um, but again, at the beginning, I give it some thought, but I don't overthink it. Now, when I'm in the end of phase, it might take me 20 minutes to place that blue. You see? Yes. Because then it's like, okay, this is near the end. I need to be very careful about where my moves are. Well, so far, it's looking pretty good to me. But here's the other thing, Sandra. I always turn my work. Oh, wow. And I look at it this way, which is very different. Yes, I, I, I'm loving that start. It is. Now I have a new orientation, or I'll turn it this way. And that's a whole new orientation, correct? How thick is your um, panel? Pardon? How thick, what's the width of that panel? Oh. It's about an inch and a half. Okay. So that's important to mention to your audience there that I'm always, I'm always shifting the orientation uh, so I can get a more objective look on it. Now do you do that at the end as well when you're yes. doing? Okay. Constantly. In fact, on certain paintings, the last decision I might make is the orientation. Because in an ideal piece of artwork, for me, Sandra, it should work in all directions. You see, right now, it's not balanced because something's all my attention's here, yes? Yes. I need to do other things. I need to put other visual elements elsewhere. You know, I might pick up a pencil and just do that, just to bring the attention over here. Yes. Now the wow. attention. The mark making there just totally balanced it out. That's right. crazy. And so because all the attention was here, each one of these is a visual element. Now I'm speaking in the language of design. So you have everything from the visual element of line to color to value to shape. So that's what I said. I just have to do something to, to bring the eye over here. And now the eye is traveling, but nothing's happening here. So maybe I have to do something here or over here. Maybe I've got this little piece of paper here I might put in or I might want it here. I don't know yet. I have to think and look and see. Yeah. So. Wow. And this is when I start to just kind of move around. Maybe I want it to go over that scratch mark and see what that does. You see, let's find out. I'm going to make this a little darker. see yeah and once you apply the um the medium it should come through yeah so we'll take a look and see how that works i'm going to be on the side here for just a second you won't see me now when i run this over here it's going to smear a little bit yep okay, not too bad that's okay yeah that's not bad <laughs> any so-called accident i invite the accidents right now i invite them if something tears if something drifts if something doesn't go the way I thought it was going to at this stage, hey, I'm fine. Just, in fact, I, I embrace the accidents, to be honest. I also am very curious and careful about my edges, Sandra. Edges are really important in my work. Why you know, is that? Where one edge meets another. Why is that so important for you? When I was a young art student back in my 20s, I had a couple of mentors. One was a woman named Irma Cabot at UC Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. She took us to a museum one day, all right, to look at work. And she said to me as a young artist, Mark, I want you to go look at these paintings and I want you to pay close attention to the edges where one edge of something meets another. She goes, that's where the action 
is. So where these edges are, that's where the action is because it's about moving the eye throughout the picture plane. She also told me, Sandra, that a good artist takes the viewer on a journey. That is very true. That and is so true. You don't want the um, you don't want the viewer to exit. You want to keep the viewer in this picture plane. You see. So now all the attention's up in here. Would you agree? Yes. It comes over here a little bit because of this color, but this is wanting something, huh? Yes. So very now, much so. Um, can you see this okay? This little image. Yes. Yep. It's a beautiful. Now see, these are these are original. This is eighteen uh, hundred. You can tell. <laughs> this letter. Wow. And so I have to, uh, and I'm going to make a point here, if I may. Uh, you can't see the letter, really, but you can see if you maybe bring it up more. I thought it was just the paper that I was looking at. Um, there we go. Oh, beautiful. Okay, now we can see it. Yes. So here's the point I want to make. I sometimes work with ephemera that's original 1800s, even 1700s, old letters and things like this. And here's the point I want to make. I will put them on in the beginning of the piece. I will put them on at the end of the piece. I will put them on in the beginning, at the middle of the piece. But the point I really want to make is sometimes they have to go away and that's very painful. And that's, that involves risk taking, okay? Yes. My point here is that I, I think it's really important in my work and when I teach to tell people do not get attached. This is about Buddhism now. This is about non-attachment. And so I might, if I fall in love with this too early, I won't be willing to change it. Hmm? It is so true. It is and, so true. And we all know, all of us painters know about those precious areas that we don't want to change, right? Well, yes. I'm going to tell you that sometimes that has to happen. It's painful. I can't tell you how many uh, times that's happened to me, but it's necessary. So now this corner has a little more visual interest because of that. It's subtle though, but at least there's some visual interest there where there wasn't before. Hmm? And it gives you opportunity because it's subtle. Correct. Now keep in mind that once this dries and I have more moves, do I have time for maybe one or two more moves? Yes. Once this dries, I will take it outside with a orbital sander and I'll sand a lot of this back. That does two things. It um, starts to rough up the edges a little bit, which I like. And so I don't always want everything to be hard edged, you see? Yes. And it gives it that aged quality of surface that I really love in, in the work, you see? Yes. Take just a couple more moves. Oh my. It's incredible what, you know, how the eye completely shift to that spot now. Now this is a line. Yeah. Line is one of the most important visual elements. There's not much line in here with the exception of these really subtle lines in here, but this is a strong line. So it takes the eye here and then down and then over this. I'm speaking about language of color, but also language of design, you see. Yes. But you know, Mark, you do have lines and it's like a repetition, but one is stronger than the other ones. Correct. Um, the invisible lines that you have between the, all the, papers that you just put down, they yeah. are lines. So it's a right. repetition of the line. So you're also your, um, your eye is going vertically at the moment, right? So um, you're going from one panel to the next, to the next, and then it kind of ends on that, you know, really strong line, but exactly. Yeah. And, and so what that, what you're discussing in Sandra, what you're talking about also is another, um, factor in design, which is visual weight and emphasis. So for instance, this has more visual weight than this. Correct. And this has more visual weight because it's a strong contrast than even here. Right. Of two, you see, right. It's about visual weight. This line now has a stronger visual weight than some of this. It's as, or I should say it's as strong as this. So it balances, you see, let me take one more move here. Now, see, here's where I'm going to be moving things around a little bit to see where I want this. Do you follow me? Yes. It's one thing to have it here. It's another thing to have it down here. It's another thing to have it here. 
And so this is when I do start to play around to see where I might want, in this case, a pretty strong visual uh, note. You see that? Yes. And I exactly. mean- Exactly, that's, it, it's, it's, a, it's what I call like a music language. So you have exactly. all these lines and it has the rhythm, the repetition, the language of community. Um, you know, it just, it's, it's phenomenal because you are really truthfully um, doing this as we are watching, which is incredible. So I'll put this on as the last note for now. Oftentimes after I sand it, like tomorrow, I'll come in with more paint and I'll scrape over and it will become more and more layered, you see. But I think that's pretty good for the moment, just to give your audience a sense of how this goes. Amazing. Do you go back and paint on top or you keep just using some of the papers that you had prepared before or how, how does this? Um... I'll give you an answer. I might do something like this and then I might do something like this. Okay. To answer your question. <coughs> yes, totally. Thank you. <laughs> so, so, so paint works this way back in here. Then I might take a rag or a, a and I might wipe away. You see, uh, this might crumble. I might, it might tear. I might do this. Oh, you see? yeah. So it becomes very physical, and I might get back to that. You see what just happened? Yes. Wow. And this is where the layering starts to happen. You wow. see, and wow. I might not like that move, and then I have to take, scrub it out, and then this gets torn, and so on and so on. But all wow. of that is, is about change and layering and history. It's about surface history. Now it's already richer. This area is already richer because of it. 100%. I'm happy you, you did that, actually. Yeah, I wanted to show you that because that definitely becomes part of the process down the road. So I'm going to take the camera back. Okay. And uh, we'll continue. That sounds great. And it's... I know we're up against the clock. No, we're still good. We're okay. good. Yep. So I'm no, no worries. If I can, I want to take two minutes to just read my quote artist statement. Yes, please. Now, we have time, so don't worry. We're not rushed. I'm going to turn back on comments. Um, so if you have any questions, um, this also will be the right time. But go ahead, Mark, and read us your artist statement. So every once in a while when I have an exhibition or whatever, they ask for an artist statement, right? We all know about that. I don't like a lot of the artist statements that I have to read paragraph after paragraph after paragraph. They're ugh, it's like, ugh, you know. So when asked, I try to keep it um, brief and in the form of prose. So here we go. It's, it's brief. I'll just read it. Uh, when I'm in the studio, nothing else matters. Time is irrelevant. No plans for the future, no past regrets. Just the present moment of plotting the next move. I'll put on some great tunes, turn it up loud, usually jazz, and break out the color, the tubes, the brushes, the rags, and then I'll enter a new piece with ferocity and abandoned. After a while, I sit back and just look, turn the piece upside down, then dive in again. I enjoy moving from knowing to not knowing, from reckless abandon to careful consideration. It is never boring or tedious, for I feel as though I'm always betting the house on the final outcome. My favorite moment is when the conversation is over. And that can take days, weeks, even months. But to know there is nothing more to be done, that everything I could possibly say has been said, and at last I can step away and think to myself, it works. Oh. <laughs> wow. And the mic drops. <laughs> there it is. What? Like, wow. I have to go back and, and listen to this again. And I'm actually going to have you send that to me because I want to okay. actually take time and read it because it is a little frazzled by now, but I'll do that. Uh, please do that. Oh, my goodness. Um, so uh, I have a few questions. Um, okay. 
And um, one is asking, when do you call the layers done? Okay, so that is the $64,000 question. When is it done? <laughs> um, do we have another hour for a week? <laughs> you know what, what we'll do, Mark? We'll do a part two. That's what we're going to do. In a couple the, months, if you're up for it, we'll right. do a part two. So here's, here's my short answer to that $64,000 question. Who is the person, or do we know? Uh, Dina. Dina. Here's my oh, answer. Diana. I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing it wrong. Yeah. The, an the short answer is time. The passing of time really critical. You may think something's done today or tomorrow or next week or next month or even next year, but time is the great judge. And we need to have that space and time away from a piece. I've had, real brief, I've had painting center that I have completed, exhibited, and put back in my storage, brought back out two years later, turn it upside down and go back into it and change it. Wow. So sometimes a piece is never really done. Hopefully it stops at a good place. Exactly. I, I like that. If you put a pause, if you're yeah. happy, you're putting a pause to it. Um, yeah. Next question is, who is the author of the line book? Oh. <laughs> and in the language of color and in the language of uh, design, I have a huge bibliography at the end of each course. So this was a uh, or this was an exhibition at the Museum of Modern Art in New York. So you can go to MoMA and take a look at their library and see if they have it. It's a great book online. It's got everything. Yeah, and I know you highly recommended that when you and I talked. Um, yeah. So, uh, Mark, I, I really can't thank you enough. Um, I am going to put a pause in this conversation. Okay. Um, and we will hopefully come back and do a, a part two because there is so much to talk about. And wow. people got really engaged. And I think that um, your work is phenomenal. And um, sorry, one more question. Do you seal the paintings? If so, is it hard to add to them, you know, when you come back? Uh, could you repeat that question? So if you, when, you, when you are done with the painting and you already sealed the painting, is it hard to come back to that? No, not at all. You just keep pushing it. And okay. it can be a small move or large moves, you know. Uh, the answer is no. Um, and again, I, I come back to that great question, when is it done? And we have to be, we have to look at our things, our work critically. You know this. We all know this. We have to really look at it critically. It's so easy to fall in love Yes. on the day of. That's the, that's the easy part. You do that right away. Boom, done, you're in love. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> right. <laughs> so we have to be more objective. And I think that's what time does. It gives us that objectivity to look at it much later and then ask ourselves, okay, is that as good as I can do or can I do better? Right, exactly. And you can always sand down, you can always gesso back in. You know, there's nothing better than the trial and error. And like you said, um, you know, the mistakes are the best part of the work. That's where you learn. That's where you want to be the messy part of it, right? It's part of the process. It's part of the language. And so it is so important to go back and just not treat it as a treasure, but, yeah. you know, treat it as something that, you know, it's, you just found it and you're grateful for it and you're digging right back into it. And, you know, the minute that you don't start treating your work as treasure, things will start to happen. Yeah. It's about process before the product. And, uh, and then another last note on this issue that we're talking. So Agnes Martin, who I enjoy very much, I've got a book on her writings, which I recommend to people. She talks about failures. She talks about mistakes and missteps. And I'm going to paraphrase here, Sandra, but it's really worth knowing. She says that the missteps are just the step to the next thing, including failures. Exactly. So look at it as just part of the process inevitably, then we, we don't let it interrupt us. We don't let it um, uh, heed our progress. It's just exactly. the thing. And I understand that all too well, because I've well, made mistakes. <laughs> we all have. Um, and um, I, again, thank you for the donation to Feeding America. I believe Annette wants the bottom one, if I got that correctly. So there's still one available. So um, I will post that today. If you're interested in buying it, please, please, please DM me or Mark. 
we are helping so many people in need. So, uh, Mark, thank you. We'll be pausing this and we'll have a part two. How about that, Mark? Great. Great. And on the person who bought the work, thank you for doing that. And Maria and I, would, it'll be free shipping. We'll just take care of that. We'll put it in a nice padded envelope and get that to you. Uh, it'll, the shipping will be free. So we'll just, you'll provide me with the address and we'll do it. Perfect. Um, someone just said, can find online on the line book. Who is the author? You, you just... Um... I can give you the publisher and uh, I'll give you the ISBN number. That's oh, the... Linnea, thank you so much. She wants the other one. So we just sold both of them. Um, oh, great. Oh, my God. You guys, um, these are two of my good friends. I painted with them. Um, they are um, also um, huge fans of your work. So um, thank you so much. We just have 5,000 meals today. Thank you, thank you, thank oh, you. Wow. And uh, quickly, the author, because we have to go. Okay, I'm going to give you the ISBN number. That's what they need. So write this down. Here we go. It's a long one. 978-0-87070-782-7. That's the ISBN number. And here is the publisher, Butler. And you can write that down. That's the publisher. Awesome. Thank you, Mark, so much. And uh, we'll be in touch soon. Thank you, thank you, thank okay. you. Take care, everyone. Have a great Saturday. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sandra.